Is anyone else out there sick of government crap? Oh my god, it's like he's saying everything I'm listening to. That's right. The government wants to tell you what foods to eat. Boo! And what church you can go to. Boo! And that you can't own a chimpanzee because you're not responsible enough. Boo! I would feed it. This video was made possible by my patrons, Joshua Bartlett, James Schubach, Hector Defendi, and Douglas Smith. Thank you so much to all of you. Today's video was selected on the basis of a Twitter poll. Check my Twitter profile every Sunday to vote for Tuesday's video on My Two Cents. Hello everyone, this is My Two Cents. As many of you know, I am ideologically speaking an anarcho-capitalist. However, to this point I haven't made too many videos specifically about ANCAP ideology. The reason for this is that I'm also a pragmatist. While I see anarcho-capitalism as the end goal for a successful society, I'm under no delusion that creating Ancapistan is anything that could happen overnight, or probably even in my lifetime. Why then do I support anarcho-capitalism, and what do I think is a pragmatic approach to moving society towards it? First, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with anarcho-capitalism, it is defined as a libertarian and individualist anarchist political philosophy that advocates the elimination of the state in favor of individual sovereignty in a free market. In layman's terms, an ANCAP society would be a society where people were free to make voluntary transactions with their own property and the services traditionally provided by government, i.e. police, military, courts, postal services, would be privately funded. Now, many people are uncomfortable with the word anarchy, and to be honest, I've never liked that term either. Not because I think it is inaccurate, but because, for better or for worse, the term anarchy has become associated with the violent overthrow of government. Anarcho-capitalism is also known as voluntarism, since it is a society based on voluntary transactions. That being said, anarcho-capitalists do not advocate the violent overthrow of government. Unless an ANCAP society was entered voluntarily, it would not be an ANCAP society. If you'd like to learn more about anarcho-capitalism as a philosophy, I've left a link to Mr. Dapperton's video that describes it in great detail, and to my video, Defending Anarcho-Capitalism, where myself and some other ANCAP YouTubers answer some of the common objections to anarcho-capitalism. However, the purpose of this video is to explain what I believe is a pragmatic approach to moving society towards anarcho-capitalism, since, as I stated, it is a rather lofty goal and not one that is likely to be achieved anytime soon. I think what is necessary is a societal paradigm shift. What I mean by this is that people need to come to a broad realization of certain facts. A great example of a societal paradigm shift is found in the passage of Obamacare in 2010. I don't think it's really controversial that Obamacare has been a disaster. Heck, even Bill Clinton admitted as much. The thing is, though, I truly believe that Obamacare was always designed to be a disaster. It may not be working, but what it did do is cause a paradigm shift in America. Now Americans of all stripes have got it in their heads that it's the government's duty to provide health care. This makes it that much easier for Bernie types and all the others who try to sell their Medicaid for all message. Whether Democrat or Republican, everyone is talking about what the government should do to fix health care, when what they should be saying is that the government should leave health care alone to the free market. But in order to get that conversation going, we need another paradigm shift. Shifts like this are difficult, and they don't happen overnight. So here's my three-step plan for working to affect the paradigm shift that will bring us closer to Ancapistan. One, educate people about basic economics. Thomas Sowell's book, Basic Economics, was my primary inspiration in this regard. In today's day and age, many politicians will try and convince you that the economy is such a complicated beast. But the truth of the matter is, economics itself isn't complicated at all. At its core is the reality of scarcity. There is a limited amount of resources that have multiple uses. So the question is, how do we best allocate these resources? Whether you're living in a capitalist, a socialist, or a mixed economy, everyone of all stripes is trying to answer this question. 
You can either give unconditional power to a person or group of persons to decide how all the resources gets allocated. You can allow individuals to allocate them based on voluntary exchanges of their own privately owned resources, or you can try to affect some sort of in-between. But the reality of scarcity doesn't change. One of my favorite quotes from Sowell's book is, if the government today were to come up with a plan for universal access to beachfront homes and put caps on the prices that could be charged for such property, that would not change the underlying reality of the extremely high ratio of people to beachfront land. With a given population and a given amount of beachfront property, rationing without prices would have to take place by bureaucratic fiat, political favoritism, or random chance. But the rationing would still have to take place. Even if the government were to decree that beachfront homes were a basic right of all members of society, that would still not change the underlying scarcity in the slightest. In the same way, it doesn't matter if the government declares that health care or anything else is a basic right. They've done so in Venezuela, but that doesn't change the fact that there are still a limited number of doctors and medical supplies that one way or another need to be rationed. Now, I'm being somewhat facetious with what I'm about to say, but in all honesty, I think it would do society some good. Imagine if, as a rite of passage, every person, when they turned 16 or so, was brought out into the wilderness. Now, it didn't have to be anything too inherently dangerous. It could still be fertile farmland with a fresh water source, but nonetheless, you were brought there, dropped off, and told, you'll spend the next year by yourself. Survive. Now, this would force every person to experience the cold, hard reality of nature. Once you were there and you were alone, you could cry all you want about how life's unfair. You could cry all you want about how you're entitled to food and shelter and comfort because you exist. However, in that brutal state of nature, all the crying in the world wouldn't change one simple reality. That reality is that crying will not make vegetables grow from the ground, or cause roast pigeons to fly in your mouth, as the legendary economist Ludwig von Mises would say. You'd be perfectly free to sit there and cry if you want, but the result would be you starving to death. If you wanted to survive, you'd have to start farming, hunting, and building shelter. Now, as I said, I'm being somewhat facetious, but this kind of rite of passage would force everyone to understand the reality of scarcity and the necessity of hard work. I seriously doubt that anyone forced to endure this would come out the other side a socialist. So again, step one on the path to Ancapistan is getting people to understand basic economics. Step two, don't send your children to public school. Public schools, thanks to, thanks to the Department of Education, have become little more than liberal re-education centers. While American students are outperformed all over the world, the U.S. continues to throw money at failing public school systems with worse results. For anyone interested in seeing a thorough documentation of this, check out the book Crimes of the Educators, How Utopians Are Using Government Schools to Destroy America's Children by Samuel Blumenfeld and Alex Newman. If you, if you care at all about your children, pay to send them to a better private school, or if you can't afford that, homeschool them. Even if you work to counteract what public schools are teaching by talking to your children at home, your kids are likely to absorb a lot of leftist ideas without really thinking critically about it, especially when they're younger. I would recommend keeping them homeschooled at least until they're in their teens and have had an opportunity to develop critical thinking skills. In fact, this is exactly what schools should be teaching, how to think. Instead, they're teaching what to think and actively suppressing the ability to think. Step 3. Help people to understand the nature of the state. Murray Rothbard said it best. The state is that organization in society that obtains its revenue not by voluntary contribution or payment for services rendered, but by coercion. While other individuals or institutions obtain their income by production of goods and services and by the peaceful and voluntary sale of these goods and services to others, the state obtains its revenue by the use of compulsion, that is, by the use and threat of the jailhouse and the bayonet. This is one of the most difficult realities for people to come to understand. From the time we're children, we're taught that the government is necessary, that they're there to protect us. Sadly, the average person on the street, Republican or Democrat or whatever else, often unwittingly speak of government as if it is some sort of omnibenevolent entity who, that thinks of nothing but making the world a better place. 
However, I want you to stop and ask yourself how the government really differs from other groups that would be called criminal. One objection that I often hear against anarcho-capitalism is that, in an ANCAP society, a warlord would just roll in and make everyone his slaves. Now, I understand why some people would think this at first, but tell me, what is the fundamental difference between a state and a warlord? A warlord is a person who one way or another has obtained a monopoly on force. He has the means to demand that the people give him their belongings or else he will force them to do so at the point of a gun, or perhaps kill them or imprison them. A warlord can at any moment break down your door, take your things, and then leave, getting away with it so long as there is no one who is willing or able to stop him. But what then is a state? A state is a person or group of persons who has a monopoly on force, usually in the form of the police and military. It has the means to demand that people give them their belongings, usually through taxes, or else men with guns will come and take these things from you by force and or throw you in prison. Agents of the government can at any moment break down your door, take your things, and get away with it so long as there is no one willing or able to stop them. The only difference between a warlord and a state is that the state is perceived as legitimate while the warlord is not. One may wear military fatigues and carry an AK-47. The other may have its members dressed in suit and ties, carrying M4 carbons. But aside from the physical appearance and perceived legitimacy, they both do exactly the same thing. Now, this is not to say that governments can't be a force for good. If people occupying the offices of government are generally moral people, then the situation is far superior than living into a society ruled by a cruel warlord. The problem is that sooner or later, a government that is perceived as legitimate in the eyes of the people will become tyrannical. James Madison famously stated in Federalist Number 51, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. He was absolutely correct. If there were fundamentally no aggressors in society, why would any form of government be necessary to regulate the free interactions of the people? He went on to argue that the solution was to limit the power of government through checks and balances so as to prevent the government from growing corrupt or allowing any one person or group of persons to have too much power. Now, I fully believe in the vision of the Founding Fathers. They had the right idea when they sought to limit the power of government so as to maintain necessary functions like the police, military, and courts in order to deal with aggressors while keeping freedom in the hands of the people. However, they still understood that such a government could eventually grow corrupt anyways. Thomas Jefferson famously stated in a letter to William Stephen Smith, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Throughout Jefferson's writings and those of numerous other founding fathers, it's clear that they understood that the American experiment would not last forever. Eventually, the government would grow corrupt and the people would have to fight to maintain their freedom. Here's the problem, though. Since the state had been set up by them as an entity legitimate in the eyes of its citizens, what was the point that defense against it would be legitimate? This is a question far more difficult to answer. In an ANCAP society, the answer would be simple. The moment a person or group of persons sought to obtain something by the use of force or coercion, the people immediately have the right to defend themselves against them as they have now become a state, a warlord, or whatever you want to call it. In a minarchist society with a limited government, the question is not so easily answered. Since the state is legitimate, how corrupt does it have to become before you can justly defend yourself? Now, I am no utopian. There will, there will be aggressors in every society, and people will have to defend themselves if they want to maintain their freedom. Further, history shows that empires rise and fall. No society will last forever, and eventually those who deny reality, such as communists, will only be persuaded that their ideas don't work by experiencing their failures firsthand. Therefore, you have to decide. Which is preferable? An ANCAP society where there is a clear-cut line where you have the right to defend yourself, even if you ultimately fail, or a limited government where it will never be clear at what point the government has become too corrupt. Once people understand these three things, the logic of anarcho-capitalism becomes a whole lot clearer. From there, the path to an ANCAP society is clear. Support policies that abolish welfare and force people to work for a living. Support cutting taxes and limiting the reach of government. 
allow the government to seek to raise funds voluntarily, making it a competitor in the market instead of the regulator of the market that obtains its wealth through theft. As these things slowly fall into place, an ANCAP society will be the logical result. In closing, as I said before, I am a pragmatist. An actual ANCAP society may never actually occur. However, knowledge is power. The more people come to understand these realities, the better the chances we have of limiting the government and allowing the free market to work, which will make things a lot better than they are now, whether we actually achieve an ANCAP society or not. I am fully committed to working alongside conservatives and libertarians of other stripes so long as you support less government and more free market competition. Honestly, I can't stand people who refuse to work with others if they don't agree with them on even a single issue. I've got to give credit to Madison and Jefferson for giving me this idea, but I'm going to make the following quote my own. Since men are not angels, all governments will become evil. Therefore, the tree of liberty must be refreshed whenever aggressors seek to control others through the use of force with the blood of patriots and tyrants alike. That is my two cents. Take it for what it's worth. Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked this video, please hit like and subscribe. You can also hit the bell to ensure you're notified every time I upload a new video. This video was made possible by my patrons, Joshua Bartlett, James Schubach, Hector Defendi, and Douglas Smith. If anyone else would like to donate and help ensure that I have the time and resources to keep putting out content, for just $1 a month on Patreon, you'll receive a shout-out at the beginning and end of every video and the link to one of your social media platforms in the description. You can also follow me on Twitter, Minds.com, Vidme, WordPress, BitChute, and iTunes. Uploads are every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so stay tuned for more videos. Also, the government wants to tell you how many children you can have. What? No! And the government wants to tell you you can't throw your old TVs into the river. Then how am I supposed to find TV?